Welcome to this teaching. Today I'm going to talk about healing. And we're going to start where we always are going to start when we talk about the Christian life. And this is with looking at Jesus. If we look at Jesus, we see two things he did. He preached the gospel and he healed the sick. He healed everybody who was sick. Why did he preach the gospel and heal the sick? Because Jesus died on the cross for us and he paid the price so we can get forgiveness from our sins. But he also paid the price so people can experience healing. And he showed that by healing the sick. But it was not enough he only did it because he said the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. So after he had done it, he called his 12 disciples to him and commanded them to do the same, preach the gospel and heal the sick. But again he said the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. So he called 70 other disciples and commanded them to do the same, preach the gospel and heal the sick. But again it was not enough. So he said to them, go out, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. What have he commanded? To preach the gospel and heal the sick. And you're going to go through this and you're going to see that this is very simple so a child can see it. But we have people today because of our religious glasses who don't obey the word of God because they take one scripture out of context, for example, Paul's thorn in the flesh. Or they take another scripture out of context that Jesus could not heal in his own city because of their unbelief. So they take one scripture there, one scripture there, out of context, and suddenly Jesus is not him who he is. Suddenly Jesus don't have any power anymore, suddenly he's not able to heal, and suddenly we are not called to obey his words. And I think this teaching is going to provoke you and it's going to help you to obey Jesus as your Lord and do what he has commanded you to, preach the gospel and heal the sick. God bless you. Welcome to this teaching. This is the fifth teaching out of 20. And um, before I'm going to start, I want to pray. God, I thank you for everything you're doing. God, I thank you for every testimony we are hearing God for. How you are using this Bible school to set people free, God. God, I pray that you will come today and help me to share your word, God. Help me to speak in this. Help me to teach what you want me to teach, God. And I pray for everybody who's seen this video that you will open their eyes, you will open their ears and open their hearts, God, so they can see you, God, so they can hear what you are telling and they can receive everything you have for them. Come with your Holy Spirit, God, and work through this teaching. I ask you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes, well, today I'm going to continue uh, talking about healing. Uh, until now, we have been talking about, uh, the focus has been discipleship. Uh, we are disciples of Jesus. We are ambassador for Christ here on earth. And as I said last time, it's like a disciple is an apprentice. It's not above his master, but everybody who's perfectly trained will be like his master. This is what Luke 6.40 is saying. So a disciple is an apprentice. A disciple is somebody who follows Jesus. And when he's perfectly trained, he's going to become like his master. He's going to become like Jesus. And this is the focus that we, everybody of us, may look like Jesus. Not only in our words, but also in our deeds that we will be his body here on earth. And uh, I've been speaking about that we are the temple of God. I am the temple of God. 
Uh, I am a priest, so I can baptize people. I can do everything the Bible tells me to. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the power who raised Jesus up from the dead is living inside you and me by the Holy Spirit. And this is some of the th things I've been teaching about on to now. And already now I have got a lot of testimony. I can see already now that people somehow are getting free. And uh, I can just tell a testimony some days ago. There was one guy who had been following the Bible school. He called me and he was so excited. And he just told me that, and I wanted to tell me that he had got the first love for God back. He, have, he, he was on fire many years ago when he got saved. But by doing church thing, just coming in the church, he have lost it. But through this Bible school and the videos we have, he have gained it back. And now he have been out the last weeks and prayed for sick people who have got healed. And this week, some days ago, he was going to baptize four people to Christ. First time he was going to do that. Four people he have led to God the last weeks. And I like this. I love this. This is what God is doing. Here we have somebody who have lost the first love somehow. But during this teaching, he have got set free from the traditions. And suddenly he experienced a new boldness. And he starts to pray for sick people who get healed. And they get saved. And now he was going to baptize the first one. I also got a lot, another email from one from the Bible school. This is a guy from Finland. He wrote to me that something is amazing have happened today. And he's telling that he was preparing food in the kitchen when somebody rang on the door. And he opened the door and it was a neighbor. And this neighbor was not feeling good. She had a lot of stress and he, she asked him to pray for her. And she experienced that the stress left her. And they start to talk about sin and forgiveness. And she said that she had been in different occult things, also in the family. And she have had some supernatural experience she didn't like. So he asked her if she wants to be free from this. And then he started to pray for her. And I want to say this is, it was really new for this guy also. But he just started to pray and he commanded this demon to leave in the name of Jesus. And after some minutes, something started to move inside of her. And suddenly she feel very bad. And then suddenly she started feeling bad. And he, something was happening inside of her. And she got a little scared. And also him because he saw it was a demon. <laughs> but he just started to speak in tongues then. And he speak in tongues and he speak louder and louder in tongues. And he's writing here, in the beginning... I started to speak in tongues because I didn't know what to do next. The Holy Spirit grew in me and suddenly I started to speak very loud. And soon I realized that I was yelling in tongues. And I was yelling so loud that it hurt my throat. And there was so much authority when I was yelling, I cannot explain it. It was like I commanded the demon to leave but without understanding what I was saying because I was doing it in tongues. And, I, and then she fell to the floor and I continued and then she was set free. <laughs> I like that. And afterwards she asked forgiveness for her sin and he ended the letter with saying, this is all so amazing and powerful. I can still not believe what just happened. It was like I was standing beside myself and watching myself doing this because it was so not me and so strong. I like this. This is a guy. God started to work in him and suddenly he was standing in a situation where there was a woman and a demon. And I've been telling about that also during this lesson. And he was standing in the same place. And he just started to speak in tongues because he didn't know what to do. And he felt the power raise, raise up in him. And she was set free and wants to ask forgiveness for her sin. And um, this is what we experience. And I have a lot of testimonies like this. Other people who write to me, who contact me, who just... Tell testimony that they have never before prayed for anybody. They have never before led anybody to Christ. They have never before healed anybody, uh, cast out a demon like this guy. 
and suddenly they start to do it. And I like his word, it was so not me. And this is what we experienced the first time we do something because everything had to have a start. And it was like, so not me, because in our mindset, we think we had to be big giants and we had to know everything before we do it. But this is a wrong mindset. The way we learn it is not to know everything and then do it. We learn by doing it. <laughs> And that's why he said it was so not me. But this is what God is doing. And today I'm going to continue talking about healing and uh, focus on healing. Next time I'm going to focus about the practical part behind the healing where we're going to kickstart you. I'm going to speak about kickstarting. After that, we are going to talk about the gospel, how we share the gospel, what the gospel is. And there we're going to come and look at repentance, we're going to look at sin, we're going to look at uh, the Holy Spirit, baptism in the Holy Spirit, we're going to look at baptism in water. So many of the questions about speaking in tongues and the gospel, I'm going to look at that later. Uh, and there is also some people who said, Tom, why, why don't you talk about that? And I'm going to talk about it. But this is still the fourth, uh, fifth teaching out of 20. So we have a lot of things we have to go through later. And I look forward to Take time to look at the gospel because this is really important. When you talk about uh, healing, there is written there is many books about healing in the world in the churches today. You can find a lot of books. Some books say something, and other books say something totally opposite. And there have been make many teaching about healing. And uh, some of the things I'm going to share now is very simple but it's going to provoke you a lot. Because many of you, when, especially when it comes to healing, you have your religious glasses on. Because it's like almost no churches today who is preaching the truth when it comes to healing. And this is our background, this is our traditions. And what I'm going to say to you today is very simple, but it's going to provoke you because of your glasses. But Look at the scripture. Look if this is not true what I'm saying. So yeah, when we talk about healing and when we talk about everything, it's important to start the right place. And the right place, of course, is Jesus. Every time we have to look at theology, every time we have to look at something, we need to start with Jesus. Because he's our Lord, he's our master, and he showed us the way. And when we start with looking at Jesus, you will see that many of the things we are trying to put together in the letters is totally messed up by what he's doing. And uh, this is the problem with theology. We, we take something here, something there, something there, something there, and then we may end up with our doctrine, they are so far away from our Lord Jesus Christ and what he came with and what he commanded us to do. So let's look at our Lord Jesus Christ because we should become like him. So let's look at him. If you are going to um, find a job today, you are going to write something called CV, a CV. This is like a part of your life, of your journey, what you have done before. And a CV is something you write down and send to the place you want to have a job. And then they can look at it and they can see, like, see how you have been living and what you have been doing. Jesus, if I should write a CV about Jesus' life and I should do it very, very short, just in some few words. I believe a good place to find that CV in the, is in the book of Matthew. And I have it here like Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 4, 23. Because Matthew 4, 23, you read, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogue, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So this is somehow a good place picture of Jesus' CV. Jesus went around in Galilee, 
teaching in the synagogue, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And if you continue reading there, you can read that the whole multitude came to him and he healed them all. So if we go here to Matthew, you can read it here. So what did Jesus do? Jesus went around proclaiming the good news and healing everybody who was sick. It was what Jesus did. What did he preach? Yeah, you can read that in the next three chapters in the book of Matthew. Chapter 5, chapter 6 and chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. It was what Jesus preached, what he taught, some of it. How did he heal the sick, cast out demons? Yeah, you can see some ways more in detail in chapter 8 and chapter 9. And chapter 9 end up with the same thing again. That Jesus went to all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogue, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. I have it here. So this is somehow Jesus' CV. And it's, my, it's very simple. So we read here. Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went around teaching, proclaiming the gospel, healing everybody who was sick. You read the next three chapters, how he preached. You read the next two, two chapters of some of the miracles he did. And then you read almost the same again, that Jesus went to all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogue, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. So if we should look at Jesus, there was two things Jesus did. He teaches and preaches. It was one of the things he did. And then he healed every disease and sickness. So if you look at Jesus' life, there is two things that is very, very clear that Jesus did again and again and again. It what he was, he was preaching and teaching and he was healing every disease and sickness. When we talk about healing disease and sickness, how many do you think he healed? Do you think he healed like 50% of the people who came to him, 60, 7%, 80%, 90? Do you think he healed 95%? Do you he think he healed 99%? Or do you think he healed 100%? Jesus healed all. And there's so many places you read that. If you go through the book of Matthew also, I have some places here. Matthew 8, 16. When evening came, many who were demon possessed was brought to him, and he drove out the spirit with his word and healed all the sick. Matthew 12, you can read about that there was a last group who followed him and he healed all again. Matthew 14, 14, you can read about a last large group one more time and he have compassion and healed the sick. Matthew 15, 30, great crowds came to him and there was many who were sick and he healed them. Matthew 19, 12, a large group followed him and he healed them. Matthew 21, 14, there was a lot of blind and lame and he healed them. So again and again, again, can you read that a large group, crowd of people came to Jesus. And out of that large crowd, he healed all who were sick. He healed them that needed healing. So what did Jesus do? He went around, he preached the gospel, and he healed everybody who was sick. He did that. Why? Why did Jesus heal everybody who was sick? Because 
It's so simple. Jesus died from our sin, but he also died and paid the price for our sickness. So there was two things Jesus came with. Salvation from sin and healing to the body. And it was what he came with because it was what he died for. And there's like three places scripture I can show very clear because Peter, 1 Peter 2, 4, 21 and 24, he's saying, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. And we believe that. But by his wounds you have been healed. So by the wounds of Jesus you have been healed. It's not only sickness he died for, he also died from our disease, from our alone, not only sin, sorry, it's not only sin he died from, but he also died and paid the price by he, his womb so we can get healed. Now we make a lot of doctrine out of it, and, and there is so many people who make doctrine and say, yeah, but this is healed, this is not, this is spiritual healing, it's not physical healing. But it can never be spiritual healing if you read the context also. Try to go to Isaiah 53. And they talk about he paid for, by his suffering, he paid a price for us. And you can read it there. And they also in the end stand by his wounds we are healed. Again, there's people who say this is physical. In spiritual healing, not physical. But it cannot be because in Matthew 8, 16, when evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirit with his word and healed all the sick. We're talking about now he's casting out demon healing on the, all the sick, physical sickness. This was to fulfill what was spoken to the prophet Isaiah. He took of our infirmities and bore our diseases. So he, Jesus healed all who was sick because he wanted to confirm what the word was saying and what the prophet had said many years before, that Jesus took our sickness on him. And it was not only spiritual sickness, it was physical sickness because he healed all who were sick. And he did it again, again, and again, and again. And if you have the glasses on you and you have been studying theology many years, maybe you have problem with some of the things I'm going through here. But if you don't have your glasses on you, and if you are just a child who don't have the background many of you have, and just read what the word is saying, it's so clear. Jesus healed all who was sick. Jesus went around preaching the gospel and healed all who was sick. Why? Because Jesus paid a price on the cross. He did not only die from our sins, he died for our sickness. And that was why he went around doing what he was doing. And here, where you read about Jesus went around in the village teaching and proclaiming the gospel and healed everyone who was sick. Then in the next verse, you can read that when Jesus saw the multitude around him, he was moved by compassion for them. And then he said something very interesting to his disciples. And I have it here. He said, the harvest indeed is plentiful, but the labors are few. I put it here. What do Jesus mean with that? The harvest indeed are plentiful, and the workers are few. What Jesus mean was that Jesus went around preaching the gospel and healing everybody who was sick. He did that. Crowds came to him, he healed them. Crowds came to him, he healed them again and again and again. But after this, he saw the 
multitude came to him. There was so many people out there, so many people who need to hear the gospel, so many people who need healing. There was so many people and so few workers. There was only him who did it. So after he said the harvest indeed are plentiful and the labors are few, he took his 12 disciples and called them and gave them a commandment. And you can read that in the next chapter. And often the problem when we have the Bible today is that we have put the chap uh, Bible in chapter and verses. So often people read one chapter and then they stop and then the next time they read the next chapter and then they don't get the right contact, context. So Jesus is healing a lot of people and he's saying the harvest is indeed a plentiful but the workers are few. Just after Jesus said that, he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them authority to go out and heal everyone who was sick and to proclaim the gospel. It was what Jesus did. And you can read here how, what he said to his disciples. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven is come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So it was what Jesus did. Jesus went around preaching the gospel, healing the sick. Then he said, when he looked over the harvest, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So he called his 12 disciples together. He gave them a faulty. He sent them out and commanded them to proclaim the gospel and to heal the sick. Just as Jesus did. And you read in Matthew 10 how Jesus' disciple did it. If you go to Luke 9, in Luke 9 you can read the same again, where Jesus is sending the 12 disciples out. But after, in Luke 9, after he had sent the 12 disciples out and given them the commanding to preach the gospel and heal the sick, he takes 70 others, other disciples, and send them out. And the Lord now chose 70 others disciples. Some words, some Bible is saying 72, but the right translation is 70. And I'm going to explain that later because we're going to have a whole hour where I'm going to talk about Luke 10. Luke 10 is a, a chapter we're going to look a lot in later. But the right translation is 70, and that's why I use 70 here. So the Lord now chose 70 other disciples and he sent them out. And then he said, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. He said that again. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. And then he gave the com them a commandment, and I have it here in Luke 10, verse 9. He said to them, heal the sick, heal the sick, who are there and tell them the kingdom of God have come near to you. It was what he commanded the 70 to do. So you see a really clear pattern here. Jesus went around proclaiming the gospel and healing everybody who was sick. Why? Because he died on the cross from our sickness and he died for our sins. And then he saw that there was a big multitude out there. Many people, few workers. So he called his 12 disciples to him. He gave them the commandment to preach the gospel and to heal the sick. After he had done that, he didn't stop there because the harvest is still plentiful and the workers are still 
few. There is so many people out there who need to hear the gospel. There is so many people out there who need healing. So after that, he called 70 other disciples to him and he gave them the same word. The harvest is plentiful, the workers are few, and he sent them out, heal the sick and proclaim the gospel. Somehow is so simple. They went out healing the sick and proclaiming the gospel. But you have to understand, I'm going to show you that now. Because it was not only the 12, it was not only the 70 who was commanded to do that. No. Because later Jesus was together with them. And there he commanded them and he said, go out, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you to the end of the ages. So this is what Jesus commanded them. Go out, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. What have Jesus commanded them to do? To proclaim the gospel and to heal the sick. And to make disciples, training them, teaching them to obey the same thing. He has commanded them. And what is that? To proclaim the gospel and heal the sick. So it was not only Jesus who did it, it was not only the 12 who did it, it was not only the 70 who did it, it's also the same today. Jesus' disciple, Christians, you and me who believe and follow Jesus, we also do the same. Preaching the gospel and healing the sick. You don't find any place in the Word of God where Jesus have commanded you to only preach the gospel. You don't, if you go out and preach the gospel today and do not heal the sick, you are disobedient to your Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus have commanded you, have commanded me, to not only preach the gospel or to not only heal the sick. He have commanded us to preach the gospel and to heal the sick. And as I have told you before, I'm not a healing guy. I'm not like totally into healing, but I'm into Jesus. I love Jesus and my focus and my wife's focus is how can we be a disciple of Jesus Christ? I don't want to stand in front of Jesus one day where he said, go away, you unfaithful servant. No, I want to stand in front of my Lord Jesus one day and he would say to me, you are faithful. You are faithful with what I've commanded you. Go in to my Lord's glory. I want him to say that, that I was faithful. I was a faithful servant. But because of our church traditions today, because of our classes today, we have so many thousands, millions of Christians who believe they obey Jesus' words, but still do not heal the sick. Because of tradition, because of we take one verse out of context, it's not everybody who has the gift of healing. And then everything Jesus has said, everything he has commanded us to do, somehow don't have, heavy, have anything to say anymore. Because we take one tradition, one word, it's not everybody who has the gift of healing. But when you have heard my other lesson, you know you don't need the gift of healing to heal the sick. But that lie, that one lie have, have come into the churches today. So because of that, we have millions of Christians who don't obey what Jesus has commanded them to do. Because they take one verse, 
one lie they have misunderstand and you know, understood. And that words was set everything Jesus have commanded out of power. Suddenly Jesus didn't die on the cross for our sickness. Suddenly Jesus don't want us to heal the sick because I don't have that gift of healing. And what we do is like he said here in Mark 7, 13, that making void the word of God by your traditions. So they have been handed down. So because of our tradition, we have set the word of God out of power. But take your glasses off you. Look at Jesus. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Then you have to take up your cross. And then you have to follow Jesus. And you have to obey him. And Jesus don't give you the opportunity to choose what you want to do. He has not said, okay, if you don't like the healing part, if you have those traditions, if you don't do it in your church setting, then you don't need to do it. No, he has not commanded you or me to choose. And if you want to heal the Savior, if you want to obey God, this is good news because then you know that when you do it, you are in the right place because this is what he has commanded you to do. I do it because he has commanded me to do it. Not because I have a special gift, not because I have a special calling, but because I'm a disciple of Jesus and I read the word of God and Jesus has commanded his disciple to heal the sick and preach the gospel and he has commanded them to make other disciples who obey everything Jesus has commanded them to do, heal the sick and preach the gospel. Somehow it's very simple and you will see that that this with healing the sick and preaching the gospel was not only in the beginning, it was something that continued in the book of Acts and it was something that continues after the book of Acts. And what you see here is very strong with Jesus that he healed all. Every time he healed all. And you read that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven places here just in the book of Matthew. I have a verse here I've taken from the Bible. And I want you now to tell me this verse, where do you think this is? Is this in John, in Matthew, in Luke? Where is it in the Bible? Crowds scattered, also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those tormented by impure spirit. And all of them were healed. So here we read, crowds again is gathering from the towns around Jerusalem. And there was people who had demons and there was people who need healing. And all of them were healed. This look exactly like this. This look exactly like this. But where is this written? This is not written in Matthew. This is not in Mark. This is not in Luke. What we just read about the crowds came and they all got healed is in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 16. That means that what we read with Jesus, that he healed them all, continued in the book of Acts. Because here we have crowds that were scattering from the village around. And they came, this time not to Jesus, this time to the disciples, and they all got healed. It's God's will to heal everybody, every time. And now we have a lot of things here. What about this? What about this? I'm going to look at that very soon. But I just want to show you. It's God's will to heal. And this is something that continues today. If you go to Mark 16, you read, 
Him who, uh, let's go to Mark 16. In Mark 16, you read Jesus saying, Go into all the world and preach in the good news to everyone. Okay, this is some, but something many is doing. But again, Jesus did not only command us to go and preach. He commanded us to heal the sick. So this is what we read. Any, everyone who believes and are baptized shall be saved, but anyone who refuses shall be condemned. These miracle signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. They shall speak in new languages. If they take snakes, it will not hurt them. And drink poison, you will not hurt them. And they will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. So these signs follow those who believe in Jesus Christ, who have Jesus as Lord, and who goes out and obey Jesus' words. They will cast out demons. It's something that will follow us also today. We will cast out demons. We will speak in new tongues. If we should take snakes, it will not hurt us. If we should drink poison, it will not hurt us. And we should lay the hands on the sick and they will get healed. And this is also what you read in the, in the book of Acts, because this is what Paul experienced also. In the last chapter in the book of Acts, chapter 28, you read about how Paul came to the island Malta. When Paul came there, it was like 30 years since Jesus was on earth. We are talking about 30 years later. Paul came there. And there was a snake who came out and bit him. And the people there thought he was going to die now because it was a poison snake. But nothing happened. He just took it out. Why? Because the word of God is not theology. <laughs> it's not only theology. This is everyday life. This is everyday life. It's not only theology. So Paul just took it off him. And there he prayed for a man who was sick. And when this man got healed, you can read here. When Paul, chapter verse uh, 8, when Paul prayed for him, he laid his hand on him and healed him. Then all the other sick on the island came and were healed. So Paul is coming to an island in Malta. He, start, he experienced that with the snake, as Matthew, uh, Mark 16 is saying. And then he pray, lay his hand on one sick and he got healed. When that happened, all the other sick from the island came to him and got healed. How many got healed? All. 100%. They all got healed. Healed. How many got healed through Jesus of the people he prayed for? Everybody. They all got healed. And while I've been teaching here, for new believers, it's so clear, but all Christians is coming in mind all the time. What about Paul? What about the thorn? What about this? What about this? And you're going to see this now. But let's start in Matthew 17. Go to Matthew 17. Because if I ask you here, how many did Jesus heal? 99% of, or 100%? He healed 100%. He healed everyone who came to him. He did that. And if you say, yeah, but he is in his own town, he could not do it. Yeah, he healed everybody who came to him also in his own town. I'm going to show you that later. But he healed everybody. And you see that. Where in the word of God do you, do you find people who did not get healed? Do you find an example? Answer is yes and no. Because in Matthew 17, you find a yes and no. Yes to the disciple could not heal but Jesus did it. And let's go there. Peter, John and James was with Jesus on the mount. And then they came down. And you, when they came down, there was a big crowd waiting for them. And there was a man who came and said, Oh Lord, have mercy by my son, because he's sick. And I brought him to the disciples, but they could not heal him. So here we have a man who have a son who was sick. 
And he brought that song to some of Jesus' disciples, not everybody, because Peter, John, and James was with Jesus. But those disciples, the rest, could not heal him. If we stop here, have we today, have you today, been in a place where you pray for somebody who did not get healed? I think the answer is yes. I believe everybody has experienced that. What do we do today when that happens? We will stop and we will come with a lot of excuses why that did, this did not happen. Or maybe this person, the sick person, has unbelief. Maybe it's because he has sin in his life. No. Maybe he didn't get healed because he needs to forgive somebody. Or maybe he did not get healed because this is a gen generation curse. Or maybe, no, is he didn't get healed because it's not the will of God to heal him because everything that happened is the will of God. Or this is maybe he's fallen in the flesh. He had to carry like Paul had his fawn to carry. This is some of the excuses we are coming with in the churches today when people do not get healed. And you can find a lot of books written out of that. A lot of books about generation curse. A lot of books about needing to forgive before they can get healed. A lot of books about sin in their life. A lot of books about, uh, about the will of God. That when people don't get healed, it's because the will of God, because it's always the will of God. And this is what happened today. This is where we get all of our theology of from today. When we stay in a place where it did don't happen the way Jesus commanded to happen, we stop and we find our excuse why things did not happen. And today in the church, when it comes to healing and many other things, our theology is built by our experience and not the Word of God. So when all our experience say that person did not get healed, then we build a theology out of that because we want the theology, the Word of God, to match with our experience instead of changing our experience and get it to match with the Word of God. But we should not build the Word of God on our experience. We should get our experience to match with the Word of God. So today, when we stand there, we build a lot of theology out of it. But this time, the disciples did not do what we do today. They did not stop and build a lot of theology. Maybe they start to do it. But then Jesus came. And when Jesus came, he missed everything up because he didn't came and say this person have sin in his life that's why he's not healed he didn't say that this person cannot experience healing because this is not the will of god for this person he did not say that this is a thorn he has to carry so because of that the disciple could not heal him no jesus didn't come with all of those excuses when jesus came he said, you're faithful and corrupt people. How long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And he healed the boy and he set the boy free. This is so clear, isn't it? Try to imagine every time we build theology, why things did not happen. We can write big books and you can read the big books. But with, if Jesus had came here on earth in his body the same way he did here, he would have come and he had just healed the boy. And then he would turn to us and rebuke us. You faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? He wanted his disciples to set them free. He wanted them to be like him. So he rebuked them, not the sick pe person. But what do we do today? We get the sick person the fault. Or we give every other thing the fault. 
Can you see it? Can you see how we, because we have seen things not happen, we build theology? We can say like, I have a list here of things we say there's a hindrance for people getting healed today. The sick have unbelief, sin in their life, need to forgive somebody before they can get healed. These are generation curse, so we have to go down and break generations curses. Or this is not the will of God. This is often what happens. If somebody don't get healed, and middle oh, is the will of God. Or this is their form to carry like Paul. This is often what we say today. But try to see Jesus. A multitude came to Jesus. And how many did he heal? He healed them all. A multitude came to the disciples. You read that there. How many do that heal? They heal. They heal them all. You don't find one time they could not heal a person because of this person's unbelief. You could not find they could not heal a person because it was a generation curse or because they have sin in their life. Not one time did Jesus stop and say, hey, you need to forgive before you can get healed or you need to break this before you can or you need this. I cannot heal you because this is the will of God for you to be sick. You don't see that in the word of God. Jesus never did that. And everything we write today, everything we believe today, when it comes to healing and why things did not happen and do not happen. When Jesus came, he did like this. And he just healed the boy. And this is what he will do today. When you are standing in front of somebody and then don't get healed, if Jesus had been there, he will heal the sick. He will not ask a lot of questions. He will just heal the sick because he paid the price for them to get healed. They didn't need to forgive. They didn't need to go through a lot of things. Because it's not about forgiveness. It's not about getting sin out of their life. It's not about all the things with generation curse. You don't find that in the New Testament. It's about one thing. Faith. And simple faith. Because the disciple asked him, Why could we not cast the demon out? And he said, You do not have enough faith. But then he said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, throw out and nothing will be impossible for you. So how, when we read it, you don't have enough faith, but if you have faith like a mustard seed. The word enough faith can also translate it with unbelief. Because you have unbelief and don't trust the word of God. You could not do it. But when you trust the word of God, when you have faith for the word of God, you can do it. And everybody who's born again have faith because you need faith to get saved. So you, when you have faith to get saved, you have faith to heal the sick. Our problem is not we need a lot of big faith. Our problem is to just trust God, to get the unbelief out of our life. And I want to say it's not you have to have faith in faith. Oh, I believe in my faith. Now I have faith in faith. No, you have to have faith in the word of God. You have to have faith in Jesus. And you have to trust what the word is saying. And when you trust that and act on that, you're going to see that this is more than theology. This is life. It comes down to one thing. It comes down to faith. But we don't dare to talk about faith today because there is in the church somebody who has messed it up. Because there is people who have healing meetings and sick people come and then they don't get healed. And he said, you don't have enough faith. And now they have two problems. Now they have their sickness and now they, they have problems that they don't have enough faith. Or that they feel guilty. But if you have faith, the person you pray for don't need to have faith. There was a woman who touched Jesus and she got healed. Why? Because of her faith. 
I experienced that in, in Poland. I was in Poland. There was a woman. I prayed for a lot of people who got healed. And then I came to a woman and I just touched her and she jumped back and, and oh, and she was completely healed. She had allergy. His, her eyes and nose was running and it just stopped and she was healed. And I was like, whoa, what just happened here? Because when I touched her, I, I experienced a power came out of me. It was so strong. And I prayed for other people, but it was not as strong as her. So I want to talk with her afterwards. And I said, what, what happened there? And she said, oh, I heard you, was com you were coming. And I thought if I should just touch your t-shirt, your shirt, I was going to get healed. And it was what happened. See God heal, not because of my faith there, but because of her faith. But what about there was a man who came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I have a servant at home who's sick. And Jesus said, I will come to you. No, no, no. Just speak one word and my servant is going to get healed. And this servant got healed, not because of his faith, but because of his master's faith. This servant was may maybe laying at home, I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick. Hey, I'm not sick anymore. What is happening here? <laughs> so he got healed, not because of his faith, but because of another faith. What about Lazarus? Lazarus had been dead four days. How much faith do he did he have at that time? None. His faith was dead together with his body. But Jesus did rise raise him up. Because Jesus had faith for it. So we need faith. We need to trust the word of God. This is so clear. But it's not like the people you pray for need to have faith. It's if you have faith, they don't need it. And, and this is the good news. If, you, if, if we take all of those away, all of our traditions away, there is only one thing back. This is simple faith. Go out, heal the sick like Jesus has commanded us to. And we can trust the word of God. But we, it's, so, but it's so easy for us to be deceived and think that it has to do with a lot of other things, that simple faith. And I have a story because I have also been deceived. Some years ago, I read a book about healing. And there was a guy who saw more people get healed than me. And he write that there was a lot of hindrance for people to get healed. And one of the hindrance was, on, uh, was unforgiveness. So if people have unforgiveness, it can be a hindrance for them to get healed. And I read that. And, and later I was out having a meeting and I prayed for some people who got healed. And then I met somebody who was sick. He had a disc problem and he had depression. And I prayed for this guy and nothing happened. I pray one more, nothing happened. I pray one more time, nothing happened. I pray the fourth time, nothing happened. But I didn't give up, so I pray the fifth time and nothing happened. And then I remember what I have heard, what I have read. So I ask him, hey, is there anybody you need to forgive? And he said, yes. My girlfriend, her ex-boyfriend, I'm never going to forgive. And I said, okay, then God cannot help you. What? Yeah, the Bible says if you don't forgive, God cannot forgive you. And again, you see that suddenly I took one word out of context. It has nothing to do with healing, but I took it out of context, context because of the book I read. So I said, you need to forgive. And I explained that he needs to forgive. And I prayed for him again. This time he fell down, he was set free from a demon, he was saved, Elahil, and he was safe and lived with God today. And, and it became really strong testimony. And I was like, whoa, this is working. So next meeting I had, there was somebody, I said, you need to forgive. When they forgive, they got healed. You need to forgive. When they forgive, they got healed. So I made some years ago a teaching that said there is the hindrance for healing and one of the hindering is that you need to forgive. But then I had a meeting where there was somebody who didn't get healed. So I said, hey, you need to forgive. Who do you need to forgive? And she said, nobody. Are you sure? Yes. And then I thought, okay, what is then the hindrance? Okay, if there's not for unforgiveness, then what is then the hindrance? And I started to... Digging people's life like many other people. 
hey, maybe this is a curse. Maybe it's, maybe there is something about Paul's fawn in the side. Maybe there is something about Timotheus' wine and stormy. Maybe there is. And I started to dig in their life. Maybe this is a curse, generation curse. And I started to dig in their life. And suddenly that teaching, that book I read, destroyed a lot of things in me. Because now I could not pray in faith anymore. When I was standing on the street and there came a sick person to me, I could not just pray in faith that they were going to get healed. Because I did not know if this person have unforgiven in their life. I do not know if this person have sin in their life. I do not know if this person <laughs> had to learn something for the sickness. I do not know that. So I could not pray in simple faith that they are going to get healed. Because I did not know if they were going to get healed or if this was the will of God. Can see how suddenly this destroyed a lot of things in me. When Jesus was healed in the multitude, when the disciples were healed in the multitude, they did not stop up and think this person maybe have sin in their life. Everybody have sin in their life. They did not stop up and say, hey, I cannot heal the multitude because there is maybe hundreds of those 500 people who have unforgiven in their life. No, they just heal everybody. That didn't stop one time the way we do it and give an excuse why things did not happen. Because they had simple faith and just did it. Yeah, somebody worked like you. When he forgave, he got healed. Yeah. But he did not get healed because he forgave. And this is what you have to understand. This is very really important you want to listen now understand this. He did not get healed because he forgave. He did get healed because of faith. Because I believed that if he forgave, he was going to get healed. And in that moment, he forgave. My faith rose up and he got healed. Not because he forgave, but because of faith. My faith. So if I believe that things work like this, I put my trust in that. And when people forgave exactly what I believe they should, it changed my faith so they got healed. Not because they forgave, but because of faith. And that's the problem with all the books and all the teaching we have today. There is a lot of books and teaching say, hey, look, this is we working. When they did that, they got healed. When they did that, they got healed. When they did like this, they got healed. And we think they got healed because they did what they did. No, they got healed because of faith. Because the people believed that if they did that, they were going to get healed. And there their faith was rising up. It's all about faith. But all of that book, all of those teachings hinder us to pray in blind faith for everybody you meet. Because you don't know this person and what's behind that person's life. But when you believe this is the will of God, because Jesus paid the price, you can pray in simple faith and they're going to get healed. Because this is the will of God. Yeah, what about Jesus? Jesus could not heal in his own town because of their unbelief. No. And we're going to look at that now. If you go with me to Mark 6, Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. Mark 6, you can read that Jesus is in Nazareth. And you can read that they looked down at him because like, is that not the son of Mary? Is, is his brother not Joseph and, and James and Joseph, Judas and Simon? So they somehow looked down on him because of that, because they know him, the family. And then Jesus told a prophet is honorable everywhere except in his own town and among his own family. 
And there you read in, chapter, in verse 5, And because of their unbelief, he could not do any miracles among them, except to place his hand on a few people and heal them. And he was amazed of the unbelief. Could Jesus not heal people in his own town? Of course Jesus could not. Could, of course Jesus could heal people. He healed all people he prayed for in his own town. But you read, he could not do a big miracle there compared to other places. Other places, when they heard about him, they brought the sick people from every place, from every town, every neighbor, the neighborhood. They brought, it, brought them to Jesus and Jesus healed them all. And it was many people. But in his own town, because they looked down at him, they only brought him a few people and he healed them. It was not because Jesus could not heal, but they didn't bring him so many. It's the same today. Among my family, among other people, people are like, oh no, we know Tom, we don't go to him. But when you are out traveling and people have seen you on the TV and heard about you, they're like, oh, let's go to him, let's go to him. And it was the same with Jesus, but it was not like he prayed for people and they did not get healed. Everybody who came to him got healed. But we have misunderstood and misunderstand that verse. And somehow we take this and put everything Jesus has done, everything he has commanded us to set up out of place and say, hey, we cannot heal people. Why? Because they have unbelief. And it's like Jesus' own town. He could not heal people, so we cannot heal people here. Of course you can heal people. People don't need to have faith if you have faith. If you believe they can get healed, they can get healed also if they don't believe. But in his own town, they only brought him a few people and he healed them all. But in other towns, they brought him multitude of people and he healed them all. So you, it's not he could not heal because of their unbelief and the same today. What about Paul thorn in the flesh? Because Paul was sick and God said to Paul that he will not take this sickness away. No, he did not say that because Paul was not sick. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 12, you can read at that Paul, he had something you read that he have a thorn. Where can I read that? Verse 7, he said that uh, it was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger for Satan to torment me and keep me from for becoming proud. And then three different times he begged to the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. How many other times did you experience sick people come to Jesus and Jesus said this? Oh, my grace is all you need. My power is best in your weakness. Go away and be continue being sick. You don't see that. When you read it by the disciples in the book of Acts, no place. You don't find that any place. But we have been write big books about these verses. Do I believe that the power of God is strong in our weakness? Of course I believe that. This is the word of God. I'm often weak. I'm, I'm weak with what I'm doing now. I'm not, not good in speaking English. I, Danish is my language and, and it's really difficult for me to do this video in English. And it, it takes so much energy. But I can see that God is still using it. When I'm weak, he's strong and he's helping me. So you can understand most of what I'm saying. I'm weak. I'm often weak. But not by sickness, because Jesus died for my sickness. Of course, God can use everything. But God don't need to use sickness to get us 
to go to change us. He can use the Holy Spirit and he can use other things. But was this sickness? No, because if you continue reading, he said in verse 10, I take pleasure of my weakness. And then he's talking about hardship. He's talking about persecution. He's talking about troubles. But where do he talk about sickness there? He don't talk about sickness. If, if Paul's thorn in the flesh was sickness, then he would say, mention sickness here, but he don't do that. He didn't say sickness one place. If you go to the next verses just before in chapter 11, you can read about Paul's CV, about Paul's diary, some of the things he went through. He was stoned, he was whipped, he was in danger of false Christians, he was in danger of unbelievers, he was out in the open, open sea for many days. Paul went through a lot of things. And there after that, he said the same, that when I'm weak, Jesus is strong. But he came with a lot of things, but still no sickness. He don't say sickness any place. He talk about persecution. He talk about hardship. He talk about problems. Jesus, did he die from our, our sins? Yes. Did Jesus die from our sickness? Yes. Did Jesus die from our problems? No. Did Jesus die from our persecution? No. He promised us persecution. And that's why we cannot pray, God, take persecution away. Because persecution is ours to carry. This is part of following Jesus. This is hardship. It is persecution. It's a hard life. I was also like, oh, God, help me take this away. But I see that when people are talking bad about me, when people are against me, it's part of my calling to carry my cross and follow Jesus. But my sickness, Jesus had carried. He had died for my sickness. So I don't need to carry that. What about Paul? He said to Timotheus that he had problem with the stomach. He should drink some wine because he's often sick. The word sick can, can also say he's weak. That word can also translate weak. Yes, but if you drink a lot of things and where this is not healthy because... It was warm and, you know, a lot of bacteria. You can become sick so, and you can become weak. So he said, drink something else. That's also today when people don't eat a healthy food I, and are, are, are weak. I can say, it, eat something else. Come on, take care of yourself. But what so if Timotheus was sick? Did that change everything Jesus did? No. Because we don't build theology out of our experience. Sometimes it's a battle. Sometimes we are standing in the battle. But when we keep on to the word of God, there can be moments where we experience some fight and some sickness. But when we know what the word is saying and keeping on to the word, we are going to see the freedom because he has promised us this. So it's not like we pray one time, things did not happen, then we say this is the will of God. No, because we know what the will of God is. The will of God is to heal everybody. And like I was working as a baker many years ago. I was a baker, yes. And sometimes I forgot to put something in the bread. Or sometimes I put the oven too much heat. Sometimes I forgot something. And my master, my boss, He became angry. He did. And he rebuked me. And I learned. And because I learned, I later become like my master. I learned to make the bread. Sometimes we are, we don't, like, we are called to be like our master, be perfectly trained, be like him. When we are perfectly trained, we become like our master. Jesus heal everybody. It's God's will to do the same today. So when people didn't, don't get healed there now, we continue, we don't give up because this is the word of God. And I had many things in my life I was fighting with. 
For example, I had a mother who got a sickness many years ago when I was a child and she got paralyzed because of that. And because of that, I was so afraid every time I was standing in front of somebody who was paralyzed because of my traditions. I had my glasses, I had my fear. But I will not accept that and say, oh, it's the will of God. So I went and started to see more things, more things. And just some few weeks ago, I prayed for a paralyzed woman who was paralyzed one side and she got healed. I've seen things and I can see in my life that my life is growing. I become more like my master. And when I don't heal a sick, Jesus is going to come to me like he did in his disciple and say, Torben, come on. This is my will. And then I don't look to the sick and say, they have sin in their life. This is the problem. No, I look to me. Sorry, Jesus, I'm not where you want me to be, but I'm working on it. I want to be like you. I want to follow you. I want to see the same thing you are seeing. And then I just continue. I continue. I continue. This is what the word is saying. So I'm going to end up with this next time. I'm going to be very practical and show you how you can start healing the sick. You don't need to do it. You don't need to wait, sorry, for me. You can go out, heal the sick. This is the will of God. You always know it's the will of God when you preach and heal the sick because this is what Jesus has commanded you to. So it's very simple. Jesus preached and heal everybody who was sick because he died from our sickness, he died from our sins. He called the twelve to him, he called them to preach the gospel and heal the sick. But the harvest was great and the worker was few, so he called 70 others to him. He called them to preach the gospel and heal the sick. But the harvest is great and the workers are few, so he said to them, go out, make disciples of all nations baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you to heal the sick and preach the gospel. So now it's you, Jesus' disciple, Christian, you and me who believe, we are called to heal the sick and preach the gospel. And only come back to one thing, simple faith. What is faith? Obedience. If you have faith to believe, to get saved, you have faith to heal the sick. You just need to take the unbelief, throw it away and go out and start to do what the word is saying. Go out and lay the hands on the sick and they will be healed, as the Bible says. So take the religious glasses off you. Paul, thorn in the flesh. No, it was not sickness, it was persecution. And if you look at thorn, each time the word thorn is used in the Old Testament, it's always persecution, never sickness. But this is the tradition coming. Paul, Timotheus, wine, come on. It's not because he was, he was weak because he was drinking a lot of things he should not drink. He needs to drink something else. But don't build theology out of experience. Build theology out of the word of God. Because the disciples, they could not cast the demons out. And we should not build a theology out of that because the disciples was not perfect. And Jesus come and rebuked them. Timotheus, he was not perfect neither. <laughs> so we should not build a theology out of experience, but out of the word of God. So this is what I want to say about healing. The word of God is very clear. Jesus died from our sickness. He died from our healing uh, diseases. He has commanded us to go out and heal the sick. And but people don't need to have faith if you have faith. <laughs> people don't need to... Uh, Forgive before they can get healed. They don't need to do a lot of things before. Jesus has already paid the price. And when people come and ask Jesus, will you heal me? His answer is always, yes, I will. If people ask him, can you heal me? The answer is always, yes. Nothing is possible, impossible for him who believes. So it's very clear. Go out, heal the sick. I can go out on the street. I can meet somebody and I can with boldness pray for these people and expect these people to get healed because I know it's the will of God. Maybe they don't get healed by the first prayer and second prayer, but then I continue and they will get healed because this is the word of God. If we don't give up, we will see it happen.
I will, I will end this video also praying for you. You who are sick out there. Maybe you have been come into a line like your sickness, lie like your sickness is like Paul's thorn in the flesh, or, or, or your sickness is because this is not the will of God, or because this is a generation curse, you had to go back and ask forgiveness for a lot of things before you can get healed. It's a lie, everything. Everything is a lie of this. Look at the word of God. Also take for everybody, take Matthew, read it through. Read Matthew through. See how Jesus healed all every time and what he commanded his disciples to do. So I will pray for you who's sick right now. And I'll end the video with this. Do you have a problem in the shoulder? Lay your hands there. Problem in the stomach? Lay your hands there. Do you have cancer? Lay your hands where you are sick. Is there many places in your body? Just lay your hands there. And I will pray God come. With you, the power right now and heal you. Are you ready for that? God, I thank you for healing right now. Everybody who's seen this video right now who's sick. Jesus, thank you because you died for our sickness. You died so we can get healed today. By your wounds, we are healed. So I thank you for healing. I say to the healing, go right now in the name of Jesus. Every cancer, go right now in the name of Jesus. Every pain in the body, allergy, go right now in the name of Jesus. I command pain in the shoulder, in the back, in the head. I command the bones to go in place. I command the nerve to be healed. I command the body to be whole in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you for healing. Right now, you're going to put your hands upon the people who've seen this video, and they're going to get healed right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you because every sickness is going to go. Leave. I command the spirit of depression. I command the spirit of fear to leave this body right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. So God bless you and look forward to continue next week where I'm going to be very practical. Do you have questions out of this teaching? Then send it to me and I will take some of the questions in the teaching next week. God bless you.